History lesson time for anybody saying that iDubs did not pioneer the commentary community. If you trust my opinion at all, when you trust what I'm going to show you, um, you'll be able to see how wrong you are, okay? What we do here is go back, 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 back. Friend of the channel, Wooly1, released a new video recently. He wanted me to react to you on stream. Um, long time, uh, long time friend uh, in the commentary community. Uh, used to make videos a lot more. Doesn't make videos so much these days. But he wanted to react to a video he made about Sam Hyde and iDubs. And I was curious to watch it. I think it's mostly about iDubs. But I am curious to watch this video. There is nothing satisfying about watching one of your favorite YouTubers self-destruct over the course of just a couple years. It's even more frustrating when you know this individual had every means to escape doing so by avoiding just a few tactical blunders. One such YouTuber is iDubs TV, a YouTube legend who once drew tens of millions of views per video, a commentary channel who blazed trails for an entire genre of YouTube content. This is the titan that... I think starting this on this kind of note is interesting because I think it is rather true. I feel like the majority of people did not want to see Idubs' career fail. You know, I think there were there were some people definitely in like Sam's fan base and people who really hated Nisa who wanted to see his shit go down. You know, there's always going to be people who want to see, you know, they're preying on people's downfalls. But I think in general, I don't think people really wanted to see Ian's career take a dip, right? I think they just wanted him to get back to making good content and wanted him to shut the fuck up about this stuff, right? I don't think he wanted to hear him talk about um, how bad he felt about saying the N-word seven years ago, right? But he just kept shooting himself in the foot. He wouldn't stop talking about it. Like, clearly you know, took over his entire mind. He couldn't, he couldn't stop discussing it. And I think that's why his, his downfall was so, you know, long drawn out, but also like relatively swift in terms of his career. Right. It took him seven years to build up his reputation in like two, maybe less than that, maybe a year and a half to destroy it. I don't think people wanted to see that happen. I think it just became a situation where people slowly stopped watching. And I think you can tell that just by the fact that if you go to his channel, right, obviously there are hate comments, but it's not like an overwhelming amount of attention from like haters like his videos don't really do that well anymore whoever's left here are like whatever stragglers are left behind and will watch items religiously i guess i don't even know who those people are the videos that would do well would be when he talked about this shit and it's because people wanted to like check in on him and see what the fuck was going on especially like i miss the old items people want to see what the fuck was going wrong with this channel but prior to this video his videos were still doing relatively well when he did post you see the Jake Wettelsberg out? Maybe we can check that out later. Ian was, but tragically, Mr. Joma has made a series of unforced errors that have taken him far from what he once was, causing him to lose the support of hundreds of thousands of subscribers in just two short years. This story reveals the depressing future in store for a YouTuber heavyweight who refuses to gracefully exit his past. Like I know for a lot of people, not a lot, for some people, the whole thing is like Idubs isn't base anymore. He's a libtard now. He's a lefty now. I never really cared about that i kind of ex have accepted that most youtubers are going to go from being right wing to left wing or left wing to right wing at some point in time and i've never been particularly attached to any youtuber i watch because of their political beliefs right i don't really give a shit the thing i care about is their content and if their content is good and i'd have stopped making good content he went from making content cop to making the documentaries and the documentaries are really good and i think in a way they were better than content cop even but he went from making like bad unboxing and content cop to making these like you know documentaries he would like explore someone more um and get a perspective on who they are as a person and i respect the fact that he did that because instead of making content that was just shitting on someone and taking all the worst all their worst moments and you know and some to some extent taking it out of context and shitting on them and criticizing them for it right instead of doing that what his content became about was exploring them as a person trying to understand them trying to delve into their psychology what makes them interesting and i like that arc from him a lot i thought it was a good evolution of where he was going because initially he would just shit on people and then it became how do i understand them how do i sympathize with them while also criticizing them while also making fun of them um, and humanizing them. And I liked that. I really liked that. Um, and that's ultimately what I've tried to do with the IRL channel with, you know, videos like the Meowdlin video or the Pow Envy video um, or some of the other stuff I have coming up. It's been like, how do I take this person that's been maligned by the internet and how do I understand them and maybe see if there's a more human side to them? And in both cases, I ended up liking those people quite a bit. The problem for items is he stopped his mission statement of content and started just making sh like shitty. It's, it's, he started making content that was worse than like a low effort commentary video, right? Like low effort commentary videos, at least there's some information there. At least there's like a take you get or two. At least there's like a milk toast opinion, right? If you're watching a critical video, at least there's something there. Nobody really wants to watch him see, nobody really wants to watch him make a video about squirrels or a video about building a cabinet a gaming cabinet like that's not what people subscribe to idubs for they stopped seeing the content that they liked the main channel became like idubs tv3 basically and it was just like why the fuck are we watching this <laughs> Thank you. 
It's hard to overstate the amount of influence iDubbbz once had over the YouTube community back in the mid-20-teens. As he was one of the first YouTubers I ever watched, it might not surprise you that iDubbbz was one of my earliest inspirations. For example, my series YouTube MD was directly inspired by Content Cop. Here, take a look. Hello and welcome to f**k. Anyway, he simultaneously- I remember those old videos. Willy One made this really good video back in the day. I don't know why he got rid of it. I think it's taken down now, though. He made this video about Wild Spartans that was really, really good. And I think it was so brutal. It's such a brutal take on Wild Spartans that he changed his content entirely. I don't know if you guys even remember who Wild Spartans is. He, in the past few years, he's known for, like, Reddit videos. He makes, like, Reddit reaction videos. All right, guys, so I'm right here today to make fun of Nissan Altima drivers, or Nissan drivers in general, because they're horrible. Yay. What happened? Oh, my. Like, whatever this is, it sucks. But uh, he used to make videos that, believe it or not, were kind of worse. <laughs> so it's probably the best he stopped making commentary videos. Before these Instagram life hack videos, he would make, like, daily trending topic commentary videos. Not dissimilar to what people do now with commentary slop. Um, by the way, I've avoided stepping on toes in regards to that uh topic the commentary slop topic of the modern day um because i just didn't i don't know i was like uh they're kind of you know not great videos but at least they get the information right but recently some of the commentary slopsters okay the slop matchers have been doing a bad job covering allegations covering serious situations and they've been misrepresenting things and i feel like i might have to uh might have to go in at some point might have to go in at some point might have to start another commentary community civil war so to speak i don't know if that's what i'm gonna do but it's been uh pissing me off i have not liked it so you know we'll we'll determine how to how to best go about that if it's even worth it soon i've been thinking about doing kind of a hawk tour on that entire situation okay because i feel like you know do i make the best commentary videos of all time no have i gotten things wrong yes do i get things wrong yes probably but i feel like some people at the top aren't even trying i feel like they're not even trying and i don't like that and i feel like they're spreading misinformation defending people who don't need to be defended and criticizing people who don't need to be criticized i don't like the way it's going so might have to break it out might have to break it out a little bit tom's a south commentary civil war no i'm the north unironically i'm the north i was only funny who's going after another creator i disagree i think it was really funny during um uh, bad unboxings. I like those a lot. Bad unboxings were really, really funny back in the day. He wasn't going after anyone there. He was just opening packages. Totally disagree. He fell way before the Airsoft Fatty Doc. His slops started piling up with unboxing videos. Those are ultra boring sloth. I disagree. I like the bad unboxing. Maybe I'm misremembering it, but I like those videos. I thought they were funny. I thought they were pretty good. I enjoyed it. But yeah, pe these people aren't even trying. It's like they're not even alive. The genius of the whole is that no matter how high you climb, you can still fall down an instant based. Tomert E. Lee. I'm Abe Lincoln. I'm Abe Lincoln. Simultaneously demonstrated a chaotic comedic talent with an ability to critically and authentically examine internet. My boy Cheetah's been cutting it close. I've been watching his recent... I haven't really... I mean, keep it up with his recent videos. I like Ishido as a guy. As like a friend, I like him a lot. Um, but he did make a few... In fairness, he didn't make videos that had improper information. He had videos that had, in my opinion, bad arguments. Like, I, I talked about one of the, 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 the Ludwig video he made, right? I thought that had bad arguments. At the very least, he wasn't including misinformation in those videos. So, um, to my knowledge, he hasn't done that. But yeah. Boogie Wokes Booth based culture when you watched an idubs tv video you knew he had no agenda it was rare in those days to find youtubers who were able to balance shock humor with clear arguments that resonated with people but this is exactly what made ian stand out from the crowd of 2016 era youtube edgelords who only knew how to say the f word and bully children ian not only that, but they also, like, their arguments were just, like, repeating what everyone else was saying and picking on easy targets. Idubs was willing to go after people that everyone liked, including Leafy. Now, did he wait to do it at the most opportune time? Yeah, obviously. But nobody, nobody, nobody back then was even trying. Everyone was making, like, shitty gameplay commentary videos where they barely said fucking anything. Idubs turned on his face cam once and suddenly everybody was doing face cam videos. You notice that? It was really interesting. Ian knew the internet deserved a better class of commentary channel, and he delivered. The common thread in most of Ian's content was his particular talent for calling out scammers and and liars. Kickstarter Crap was a series where he would call out questionable to fraudulent crowdfunding campaign. Do you think Idubs would have dodged a lot of the flack he got if he rebranded? I think that the rep of the Idubs name was what continued to drag him down when he wanted to be Ian Jama. I disagree completely. I think, I don't think that would have made a difference. I don't think branding really matters that much. I think what actually matters is just making good content. I think that's like 98% of what matters on YouTube, right? I mean, look at Doc. Look at, we just talked about Doc. Doc is a fucking weird guy. He's a, at the, at the very least, he's lying about whatever the fuck happened. And Doc is making good content that people like. He's making streams people like. And he's succeeding and that's what i think that's what he knows works it doesn't really matter what the fuck you do what matters is that you make good content as long as you're not in jail you'll probably be fine 
which is like simultaneously comforting because on one hand, that means that like retarded allegations and bullshit don't really affect people. But at the same time, real shit that goes on sometimes people won't give a shit. People won't fucking listen to reason. So yeah, I watched a Daniel Larson video with this girl I was talking to two nights ago and she broke things off with me today. Is Daniel Larson the reason I'm cooked? To be honest with you, bro, I think that girl might've been based. Okay. Look, I like Daniel Larson lore. Okay. I like that shit. But if the girl you're talking to is into Daniel Larson lore and is into the same shit that you are, she's probably weird. Okay. She's probably weird. If, if the girl you like is into the weird schizophrenic internet shit you are, she might be, she might be a weird person. Okay. You might not want to be around her. Like when I think of like my ideal girl that I want to date, to be honest with you, it's not a girl that is like into YouTube drama lore. Okay. It's not. <laughs> I don't want to date a girl who knows what Kiwi Farms is. You know, I want a girl who's rich, drives a Mercedes and buys me expensive coats for Christmas. That's what I want. Where are all the rich? Can we talk about this? Where are all the rich girls at? Where's my rich girlfriend? Where the fuck is she? My wife doesn't know who any of the people I talked to in this video are. Well, that's base woolly one. You want to be a gold digger? I do want to be a gold digger. God damn it. Where are the rich 22 year old girls, dude? Where the fuck are they? Where are the rich women? Married to rich guys? Well, I'm a rich guy, kind of. So I feel like I should be included. Marry me, bitch. What the fuck? Tom, I'm here. Thanks for the dono. But yeah, bro, where? Come on. Where's my lawyer girlfriend? Where's my uh my investment banker girlfriend? Okay, where the fuck is she? Where is she? Where's my Stanford GF? God damn it. God damn it. Ints for their attempts to steal backers' money. And of course, there was his flagship series, Content Cop, where he would call out large YouTubers for lying to their fans or engaging in unethical behavior with comedic sketches and on the street skits. Never goes to OnlyFans. There must be Okay, there must be rich women who don't do OnlyFans. They gotta exist. I know they're out there somewhere, okay? Aren't women making more than men right now? Isn't the isn't the wage gap closing or something? Come on. All the rich girls look like guys? I know that's not true because I live in a town of rich women and they don't look like guys, but I probably have to talk to them. I probably have to speak to them, to be honest. That's probably the problem. I feel like they're not gonna come talk to me when I'm streaming about uh, YouTube drama in my room alone. I think I just have to go to Harvard. I think I just have to reapply to college and try to get into Harvard or something. I need to, or maybe I can just lie. Maybe I can just lie on my application, pretend to be someone else and go to college. Maybe that's what I have to do. Can I just forge a college, app college application so I can date a rich college girl? Whoa, wait, this is genius. Hold on, we're cooking here. Sorry, back to the, back to the video. <laughs> the nature of these videos was often brutal and uncompromising, but this was from a lawless time back before advertising and content guidelines were enforced. Nobody was able to get a one-up on him because anything they could do, he would do better. For example, when Leafy is here, a YouTuber who had the honor of being featured in the Content Cop series, mocked Ian's receding hairline, he proceeded to shave it down even further in his response base. video. Or during the keem That was so, that was so base though, because he just showed he didn't give a fuck. Because Leafy's entire thing was like, he was like very proud of his appearance. He was like, I look like a little anime boy. I, I look like all these cartoon characters, all these cute anime boys. And it's like, bro, you're gay. We like the ugly guy. We like the ugly chick. Chad. Even though Idaho isn't even ugly. I, I honestly don't think his hairline was even that bad. I mean, I've donated 120 bucks. Your name is Shadow Kitten and you're watching my stream. It's over for you, I think. Star Content Cop, where he went out to a California desert with his friend and repeatedly shot a gnome. <laughs> 80 grand a year girlfriend. <laughs> 80, not 80, $87,000 a year income girlfriend. Where the fuck is she? Where is she? Can't you see I've been bulking? Can't you see my negative canthal tilt? All right. We're getting back into it, Jesus Christ. No more brokies. Effigy with a 12 gauge shotgun. To give you an idea of how enthralling these videos were, one user said of the Keemstar content cop when it was released, his arguments are absolutely perfect, while also being really funny and calling out an absolute shit arse for what he is, better than anyone has done before. The last content cop was released all the way back in 2017, and it was definitely one of the weakest of the bunch. Anticipation had been building since his wildly successful Tana Mojo content cop, where he exposed her for being a hypocrite on racial slurs, and everyone was wondering what would come next. I remember everyone making predictions about who it would be. Would it be Logan Paul, Jake Paul, maybe Keemstar part two? Instead, iDubs gave us content cop rice gum. Yeah, this is honestly the weakest one. I still enjoy watching it as a piece of content. It had like, I say the highest production value and effort put into it and the diss track is kind of funny, but um, this is the arguments. I think it was kind of the weakest one. Girls in my town make 73 cents to the dollar. Well, got to date a girl from fucking Duxbury, Mass, I guess. Jesus. Where's my Duxbury girlfriend who wears uh, Lululemon and Athleta? <laughs> Where is she? <laughs> 
She's got to be out there. If you don't want me as your rich base girlfriend, I'm going back into hiding. Him. I'm going back to hiding my room. Daniel will be very pleased. Yeah, you enjoy him. You enjoy him now, okay? The video itself was well written and made a few good points. Hell, I even defended the video at the time. But ultimately, this final content cop had very little effect on Rice Gum. Those who hated Rice perhaps hated him a little more, but it did little to die. I also think some of this shit was like, I was just like, you made fun of a girl who got raped. And it's like, okay, well, the girl wasn't mad. She didn't really care. And secondly, like, are we really, are we getting mad at edgy jokes now? You know, I'm not saying that what, what Rice Gum did was good, but it was funny. I would have laughed if I'd have said it, right? It kind of became more soy, you know? It became more woman influence. And I think that's the Anissa influence for sure. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it, all right? There's no doubt about it at all. Yo shift public opinion against him. It wasn't that it was a bad content cop, it was just the format itself had been worn out. In retrospect- I don't think the format had been worn out. I think he just picked a bad topic. I feel like content cop could continue to this day. I think it just like, the demand for a content cop made him make it on someone that was like, yeah, Rice comes obnoxious and annoying, but a lot of the criticisms made don't really matter. And they kind of apply to items himself. So it was kind of like, eh, eh, eh. You know, if you look back at that, at that episode of Content Cop, which is like re-uploaded now, you can't even watch the original, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it got fucking deleted, bro. Do hit us go back, back. Like the skits were still good, but the points were like, whatever. It's about an entirely different obnoxious, arrogant asshole. I remember, I think at first I thought it was going to be, because he called it Content Cop Jake Paul. He was like, I don't want to give him attention, so I'm not even going to say his name. It's like, he already has 10 million subscribers. Does that really even matter? Some of you might be pleasantly surprised with who this video is actually about. I'll give you a hint. He's very boastful. He's made a video on me. Dinga, 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 dinga. That's right, everyone. I'm talking about Asian Jake Paul. You, you can't just hide, hide for months and make a 20 minute video and randomly no one even knows and surprise everyone and just drop it on my head. You can't just do that. I'm doing that. I'm doing it right now. If you were to make a rice gum content. Love your content. Keep slaving for us, gang. Also, I bought the new swag t-shirt to feel the Tommy Empire. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You'll enjoy it very much. When you get it, be sure to uh, send a picture to the gram so I can repost on my story. If you want to be featured, featured. Content cop, I mean, that would blow him up even more. Oh no, I didn't title it that. I guess I'm not gonna blow up. <laughs> Jake Paul, you've made a wonderful scapegoat, so I don't have to give this bit of mucus the satisfaction of having his name in the title or his face in the thumbnail. I feel like a content cop on Jake Paul probably would have been good, or like Logan Paul. I feel like the reason he didn't do it is because Jake Paul was just talked to death and he wanted to pick like a harder target. But looking back, I feel like a Jake Paul one probably would have been better because there were more points against him. Now that all of that is out of the way, we're going to react to a video that this hype beast released about a year ago, essentially begging for a content cop. Begging for a content cop. Here he goes through the seven deadly sins. Because the police aren't giving us very many answers, and we're gonna get down to the bottom of it. Uh, back to you, Cheryl. Gooning! Hey. Items is gooning. Make sure you stop it. She'll let me smash, bro. Bro, she'll let me pipe her shit. Yeah, bro, she definitely wants to fuck me. Bro, she low-key got some titties. I think she's 16 to 15. I ain't gonna lie, bro. She got some titties on her, bro. When it comes to showing off the uh, <laughs> rapper Whoa. lifestyle, whether it be with women or money, I think you could've talked about that more. He has the most generic taste imaginable. Let me pile 14 women in front of me to show you that I I get women. Do you believe- Like once again, like I just, I, f I feel like at the point that Constant Cop was at here, I feel like you need a little more to go in on him, you know? Because the Leafy one was so good, it highlighted such degenerate hypocrisy. It was more like a reprisal act. It didn't fill a content void the way that the Keemstar or Leafy content cops did. I suspect this is also the reason why there has been no new content cop in the last six years. It's not like there's been no poor behavior on the internet in need of being called out. Far from it. But there are so many talented creators already calling them out that Ian's content cop work is finished. He could trade his policeman hat for some laurels to rest on and pivot to less... Maybe that's part of it. I mean, in recent times, he's also talked about how... He feels bad for bullying people on the internet, which is like, who fucking cares, bro? It was funny. It was funny in base, and everybody you picked on was also, like, a retarded person, so they deserved it, but yeah. Intense personal passions, like his friends Filthy Frank with his music career, or Max Mofo and Anything for Views with the Cold Ones podcast. At least this is how things should have gone if they were allowed to take their natural course. But if you're familiar with this story, you'll know that's not how it played out. Uh-oh. 
only problems. Uh -oh. I'm old enough to remember a guiding principle of the early days of social media. Never feed the trolls. This means that when people are engaging in shitty behavior online for attention, don't feed into it by giving them that attention and they'll eventually go away. But as simple as this sounds, it seems like nobody ever follows this advice. How often do you- Some people do. You just don't hear about them because it's never even a thought. Because the thing is with iDubs and the OnlyFans thing, most people wouldn't have even thought about it if he hadn't acknowledged it in a video and fed the people who are bullying him over it, right? Like a lot of people do follow this advice. You just, like every content creator gets like trolled. I, I'm sure I get trolled. I can't think of a clear example right now, but I'm sure I've been trolled. I'm sure people have tried to bait me into saying some shit, right? But like, if you just ignore it, it doesn't matter. It goes away. But Idub seemingly could not do that. He had to address the trolls. You see a trend only catch your attention because other people with large followings are having a negative reaction to it and talking about it. For example, take that TikToker who people like Keemstar kept rage posting about on Twitter, who ate a sandwich he bought for a homeless person right in front of him. That guy. That guy was so funny. I gained literally tens of thousands of subscribers <laughs> due to the attention he got and has faced none of the negative consequences people have called for. Twitter does this all the time. Yeah, because people get mad at something, right? They get outraged at something. They're like, fuck this person. And then they only end up giving them more attention. Like with Bella the Wolf, right? We just talked about this. Bella the Wolf, degenerate troll, obviously saying shit for attention, trying to bait people into talking about them. And everybody's like, how could they ever say this for attention? That's why when someone does something crazy and they're not like an established content creator, you have to wonder like, is it because they're, you know, genuinely espousing that opinion, they genuinely believe in it, or is it because they want attention from commentary channels? Because there's a, there's a manufactured outrage mob now where anytime you do something shitty, you can get a bunch of people to talk about it. And if you're going to be a commentary YouTuber, you can acknowledge that what they're doing is shitty and that you're just playing into it. That's fine. I don't really give a shit. I don't like the moral posturing though. Like, how could they even say this? I have to call this out. Like, bro, no, you want to make money off commentary video. Just say that. It's fine. The news does this it's all entertainment. the time. And yes, YouTubers do it too. They'll argue with their commentary. Thanks for buying the merch. The NA works. Appreciate it, bro. Stop gooning. Salute 07 out. Just when they say something rude and in their righteous anger, give them exactly what they wanted. Attention. The Anissa Joma controversy is probably one of the most misunderstood controversies I've seen on this corner of the misunderstood. internet in a long time. Where Idubs used to be perched as a level-headed observer from the outside looking in, he found himself directly in the eye of the storm. You see, Idubs now wife announced in early 2020 that she would be opening up shop on a popular adults-only subscription-based website. This shocked a number of people. Rhymes with lonely mans. The thing is, I think, can you not say the word OnlyFans on YouTube? I didn't know you couldn't say that. I thought you could. At the time that this video came out, I'm pretty sure I made a video on my, uh, the video didn't age super well, did it? But I think I made a video on my main channel. Look up Turkey Tom iDubs. I made a video kind of defending him. Uh, yeah, this video. Where I was like, look, you know, he didn't even acknowledge it, but, you know, honestly, a lot of the criticisms people made of him are dumb, and he has a right to respond if he really wants to. And this guy left a really good comment that I agree with. He said, I always thought the main problem with iDubs' response to the whole thing was that he responded at all. If he had ignored it or just posted that one tweet, it would have been fine. But posting a whole video made it seem like he was mad at hell, mad as hell, and really, really care what people think about him, which just wasn't on brand for the Adams persona. I generally agree with that. Like, it wasn't that the points he had made were bad, or that like the people criticizing him weren't cringe, but it was like, why did he even need to respond? You know, there was no real reason to do that. What do I sound like at this point? He's actively become what he hated in the first place. I dubs, meanwhile. Do I sound like that still? Do I sound different? Now, was never this holier than thou fake that everyone made him out to be. From a creative perspective, sure. But as a voice of moral authority, the do I sound the same as that? Did my voice get a little deeper? What do you guys think? The role was thrust on Did it rather than actually embraced. I feel like if I got a little deeper. And as a result, once people realized there was one moral disagreement they had with him, they tried to throw other Sound the same? Dude, it's over for me. I lost. As it seemed to fly in the face of what Ian stood for. To be clear, Ian had Did my voice get a little deeper, guys? Never come. You have better mic. I think I might have I might be using the same mic. I don't remember. I might be using the same mic. I'm out against this manner of bag chasing in the past explicitly, but it definitely didn't fit with the perception that many of his fans had of him, that he was based or whatever. And it wasn't just that he was supporting a friend who chose this line of work. He was in a committed romantic relationship with this individual. Many felt that the content cop was supposed to go against the grain and be the edgy guy who called people out when they were at the top of their game. This was the guy who made Leafy cope and seethe so hard, he tripped over his chair and still posted it online. 
after all. But iDubs the content cuck? To many, it was just embarrassing. But unlike Ian, I'm not gonna moralize from on high about how you hate women if you find this behavior immoral or how you're a cuck if you find this behavior acceptable. Truth to be told, it doesn't matter because if you were alienated by Ian, fully supported him, or just really didn't care all that much like I did, that wasn't even the side of the discussion that he addressed when he did release a video in response to the controversy. Instead, he spent half of it expressing annoyance that people would assume his position on certain topics at all simply because they were fans over the years. And the other half, he spent cherry picking a couple easy target videos, arguing that what his then girlfriend was doing was wrong. When someone releases a highly and to be clear, I think his points against them were generally true. The greater thing is just like, did he need to respond, right? Does iDubs with 5 million subscribers need to respond to these like small shitter channels? Um, I mean, a Tozy is not a small channel, but like, did he need to respond to a video a Tozy probably made that got like 400,000 views where he's like debunking the allegations when ultimately it doesn't really matter. I feel like he would have been better off if he just ignored it and didn't care, right? Even if he did care. There's no point to giving these people ammunition, giving them attention, right? It doesn't really matter. Polarizing video. People take two basic sides. Either the presenter is right or they are wrong. But there's also a third option. Maybe this video doesn't need to exist at all. And that's how I feel about Ian's sex work video. Primarily, I just don't buy that it was as controversial and in need of addressing as Ian made it out to be. It seems to me that if Ian had just left well and well enough alone, brushed off the controversy as a few angry people on Twitter, and went on his merry way, he probably probably wouldn't have alienated as many people as he did. As one commenter on the video eloquently put it, Idubs made a mistake sticking his in the hornet's nest like this. Even if his stance and points are valid, nothing was ever worth making this video. He could have ignored the trolls and did his own thing, and I'm sure he wouldn't be dealing with drama constantly like he has been for the past year. But consider this, this is Idubs we're talking about. This isn't some ignoramus who's completely disconnected from reality and who has no idea how to handle backlash. Can we really say that he had no idea how poorly this video would come across? This is the content cop for Pete's sake, a grandmaster of for Pete's chess, sake, and you'd be right. The yeah, I think he's right here because this is something I really considered at the time. Items was not like a shitter commentary channel that responded to everyone, right? He wasn't the guy who responded to every criticism made of him, every situation. He wasn't that guy. He was a guy who like spoke when he felt like he needed to speak, gave his opinion when he needed to. And beyond that, he just shut up. He wasn't really, he wasn't really even in the community apart from collabing with a few really big names, right? You wouldn't see him on like a Chud Logic stream or the equivalent of that, right? You wouldn't see him on baited podcast or shot from the point that wasn't something you would expect him to see him on so to have him respond and like lower himself down to this kind of thing did set kind of a new standard of like wait he's willing to respond to people he's going to respond to these idiots or you know he's going to respond to even valid points you know what i mean it, it, it brought him to a different kind of era new anti-gooning hats go hard with cat ears i think that kind of defeats the purpose of it but if that makes you happy then buy it i don't care thanks for the 20. the only way these actions make sense is if they were intentional and to illustrate this point we need to pay another visit to the second time idubs bled the documentary on sam hyde if you're watching this video, chances are you've also seen my analysis on the Sam Hyde documentary incident where I concluded the entire incident was a tactical error on Ian's part. These are some of the best videos of, when did they come out? 2021, 2022? Those videos, that saga, that drama, seeing like Sam's version and then seeing Ian's version, seeing all the discourse was like one of the most interesting things that's happened on YouTube in the past few years. It was so good. It was so weird for me to see as somebody who had watched both of them for a while. It was really weird. But now that we have more context about Ian and the direction he wants to go with his channel, I think it's worth revisiting the saga in a new light. I highly recommend you watch my video if you haven't already, as I stand by most of what I said. But as a recap, Ian visited Sam Hyde in 2020 to film what he implied was a Where Are They Now documentary. Over the course of roughly one week, Sam trolled Ian through a series of ruses, including pretending to have a pill-addicted girlfriend and pretending to have pivoted to producing hip-hop tracks such as Swag Like I-Dubs full-time. Swag like Adam, oh, swag like Adam, swag like Adam's A. The climax of the encounter was reached when Ian sat Sam down for an interview where Sam eventually revealed everything Ian had filmed was made up. And she doesn't do drugs. I know she does hair and nails. The footage was not seen until about 2021 when Sam uploaded his footage from the visit himself, seemingly forcing Ian's hand to finish the documentary, which he finally uploaded a few weeks later. The reason why it's important to revisit this affair is because Sam's publicly stated opinions about the meeting began to sour in the months following it, including after my video was released. In the pretext to Sam's cut, he notes several times that he never gaslit items to make him look like a fool. He did so to make the video entertaining. But since then, we've seen his explanation of the events change, now stating that he knew all along that items came to Rhode Island in an attempt to make fun of him and to 
I'm curious why his opinion changed. I'm curious, did he think that from the beginning, Idubs was going there to punk him and he wanted to punk him back? Like, was that the genuine opinion the whole time? Or was it more his opinion publicly changed after the fact? Like, was was he kind of bluffing afterwards? Or was he like kind of making it seem okay in the moment? Because he was like, oh, well, I'm still getting clout off of this shit, right? I'm still getting attention and popularity. Idubs did help me out inadvertently, whether he realized it or not, if he came there to punk me or not. So, you know, it was kind of like a tactical move to say publicly he didn't have any ill will towards idubs or something you know i don't really know show how he's fallen off but the documentary was extremely well cut it was neutral it represented what happened i think he was as neutral as he could be i know that some people are like oh you mentioned uh, racism like here his his take is a lot different than what he said later he's got he's got eight million subscribers he has to mention racism after the documentary came out we put out a video that was our response to it and that was that was to give him an out. Like I knew I knew from the get go that he was coming out here. Because here he says he was giving him an out. Basically, he was showing goodwill at the time to punk to make me look bad. Sam's harmless jokes were therefore actually countermeasures to get one over on him to puppet master the puppet master, if you will. But whether Sam knew Ian's intentions ahead of time or not, Ian's recent actions have caused me to rethink everything. The more I think about it, Ian could have chosen anyone in the entire world to make his documentary about. There's certainly people who are more well known who he has access to. So why did he choose Peanut Arbuckle? You see, this all goes back to Idub's previous video video about his wife. He wasn't just epically owning people who had an unhealthy obsession with him. He was actually making a personal statement about Ghost of Kiev, ha ha ha. About how he's matured as a person. In fact, Ian would go on to expand on this idea in his Froggy Fresh response video and harp on the point further in the I miss the old idubs video, both of which we'll discuss later. Suffice it to say, to defend Ian a bit, in terms of like punking Sam or like getting him and like exposing him, I think that probably was part of what he wanted to do. But at the same time, if you want to do a like an in-depth neutral documentary about Sam Hyde, you have to talk about the politics stuff because there definitely is political messaging behind some of the stuff he said in World Peace, some of the skits. Um, I mean, Sam obviously is a very right wing dude. I mean, you can't deny that. I'd say alt-right, whatever term terminology you want to use, you know, far right. Um, he is that kind of guy, you know, if you've heard him talk about this stuff um, in any, you know, capacity where he's not joking, it's very clear that he does believe in like, you know, Jewish power and stuff like that. Sam isn't right wing. That's just retarded. I'm sorry. He's not. He sorry. He is. He, he is definitely right wing. <laughs> um, you do have to talk about that kind of stuff, right? All right hasn't existed since 2017. Thank you very much. Whatever you want to call him, he's far right, okay? The all right hasn't existed. He has an alternative conservative viewpoint, okay? He is further right than most conservatives. He aligns more with like, I don't know, Trump's definition of conservatism, maybe, but even Trump isn't really... Sam's probably farther right than Trump. I don't even know how much Trump believes about the shit he says. But you, you can't you can't ignore the political stuff if you want to talk about Sam, right? I think part of the problem is that Ian tried to do it in kind of an underhanded way, and I think it obviously gave Sam a very um a very weird vibe about how he was going about it. He's definitely far right, but he's still funny, so I don't care. The thing is you don't have to care. I'm not saying you should. I don't particularly care. But I do think if you're gonna make any documentary piece about Sam Hyde, you have to talk about his politics. Um because and, and it's not because like, oh well the politics don't matter to the skits. If you watch enough of his content, you see like the politics do make its way into his jokes and stuff like that, right? He's like Candace Owens far right, Nick Fuentes far right. I mean bordering in that territory, I would say, yeah. Ian has wanted to make a video where he explains why he is moving on for a long time now. But part of me wonders if maybe he already tried to make that video with the Sam Hyde documentary. You see, when you create any piece of content, you're supposed to try to tell a story and documentaries are no different. Maybe he was going to use Sam as an example, a cautionary tale of the fate that lies in store for those who try to keep their edge and don't change with the times. Maybe he was going to use it as a justification for his newfound maturity. On the other hand, as as compelling as I find this theory, that wasn't the video we ended up getting. Instead, the documentary just kind of fizzled out after Sam revealed his antics to Ian. But even if Ian intended to make something more substantive, his hypothetical lack of follow through was probably for the best. Looking at the successes that Sam and his million dollar extreme crew have seen in recent years with the popular fish tank and the upcoming MDE World Peace 2, his assumptions that shifting with the Overton window is the only way to stay relevant has aged about as well as Slenderman Gangnam style. Ah! Ah, oh, Slenderman Gangnam style. Excellent choice. After the events of 2022, I was hoping that Slender items Man had Gangnam finally style. found some peace. Despite opening that was Pandora's fire. box by <laughs> messing with Sam I love, Hyde, Slend I love Slenderman Gangnam style. Can we watch that? I want to watch. Idubs Slenderman Gangnam style. I remember this got brought up in the leafy content cop. Yeah, this video is. Oh, there's a note. Kino. A note. Seven of eight. Seven of eight. Then I get eight of eight and I win. Oh! 
Oh shit, he's right there, he's right there. No, 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 no. Don't, don't come near me, don't come near me. Open Gangnam Style. Yeah, now that's some good content, okay? We gotta bring that back. That's the real old items. That's the real items that we missed. Did get the last word out on Sam and Ed Did items reach out to do a doc on you? No, he didn't. In fairness, I, I mean, in my response video to him, if he saw that, I basically said it would be fucking boring, but um, yeah, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't really think it would be a very interesting doc. Redirected his focus towards his YouTube boxing promotion career. It should have been a time for him to recenter on the content he really cared about without distraction. But sadly, this is where Idubs made a third and near fatal unforced error. For some context, Idubs' focus for the last two years has been on an annual event called The Creator Clash. It's a YouTube influencer boxing event with the simple goal of having fun and raising money for charity. YouTube influencer boxing has been around for about half a decade now, with the very first fight being between UK YouTube Joe Weller and Theo Baker, which took place at a no audience UK studio in 2017. One of the largest YouTubers in the UK, KSI, challenged the winner of the match. Since then, the state. It's crazy how big YouTube and influencer boxing was for a while, considering that seemingly nobody gives a fuck about it anymore. Like, nobody even talks about the shit. I heard that because Brandon had another fight he was supposed to do, and it just never happened. I don't think they're even doing, like, is Misfits even doing these events anymore? I think the only thing that's happening anymore is these, um, I think the only influencer boxing stuff that's happening is, like, Jake Paul and Mike Tyson, if that's even happening anymore. It doesn't seem to me like they're really doing these big events anymore with a lot of payment involved. Misfits had one, did they? Thanks. Misfits, influencer boxing. Misfits influencer box. I don't even hear about it. the bet. They did another one, really. Misfits seventeen is in the books. We just had a quite frankly solid show. I'm shocked they're still doing this From even. Misfits Maybe I'm wrong. I thought influencer boxing like fucking died. Nobody was watching it anymore. For Warren Spencer, the way they were fighting at that high in the ring, he fought wins, which he should have. It's but hey, man, heavyweight. I was under the impression nobody even did it anymore. They still have them. They just don't get as much attention. Okay, gotcha. Interesting. Question, how do you find content for your videos? My husband introduced me to you. I listen to scary stories from Markiplier. Let's see on my YouTube usage besides music. How do I find content? Uh, I just use the internet. And cash have been growing seemingly exponentially with contests like KSI v. Logan Paul 2 and Floyd Mayweather v. Logan Paul generating well over a million paid viewings. Numbers that are comparable to professional bouts without YouTubers. Even if you're just using like the three websites that everyone else uses, which is like YouTube, Instagram, and I don't even know, Snapchat is how people use, like you might not find the stuff you want to go over, right? If you're just using any other website, like Twitter, Reddit, I guess, Kiwi Farms, you're going to find, you're going to find stuff to talk, like scary stuff, right? It's just not always going to be on YouTube. Most of the stuff people talk about on YouTube is stuff that comes from some other site. Like you just use the internet. I know there's a San Francisco creator clash. That would never happen. Even Sam Hyde joined in on the craze in 2022, where he successfully defeated his opponent under the pseudonym The Candyman. But boxing and MMA have always been bitter contests inside the ring and out. Your wife is in me, DMs! Idubs didn't want to create just another boxing event. His vision for Creator Clash Your was wife a more is in casual, me, friendly contest with no fake beef, no ugly drama, and no Muppets screaming Walmart at each other. This is what I never understood about Creator Clash. Like, does anybody want that? Does anybody want like this friendly event where everyone gets along? It seemed to me like it seemed to me like Ian, ironically, and like Anissa were kind of pandering people who didn't like YouTube drama, which is weird because that's what he built his entire career off of. He was pandering to like the Twitch Poggers community, I guess, um, like Mizkif type people, like Cutie Cinderella, Minx, people who hate drama because anytime they get involved in it, they look retarded. It seems to me like he was pandering to those kinds of people rather than, you know, just the broader influencer community. Because I think there's no doubt, like, these people are not good at boxing, right? They're not. So the only thing that's going to make influencer boxing good is going to be seeing them shit talk each other in the lead up, right? Like, that's what's that's going to make it good. What's going to make it good is not going to be, like, everybody being super, super nice, you know, to each other. That's not going to build hype. What well, builds hype is people shitting on each other. People getting into beef. He just didn't get enough big names. I didn't go into it in the video, but these people were way past their prime and didn't deliver the views needed. I mean, it's that, too. But the thing is, like, the most popular people from any of these events are people who had, like, a persona and did some drama shit with it, right? Like, people like uh, Harley Morenstein, right? Him, the dad guy, right? They were, you know, shit-talking their opponents a little bit in the lead-up to the fight, and they made it entertaining. But, I mean, they didn't have big names, for sure. I remember looking at the rosters back then and being like, why is this guy that's averaging, like, it has, like, 100K followers on TikTok, 20K on YouTube, and is, like, not relevant involved in this fight at all you know how could they not get someone else i think it's because they were picking and choosing who they could have on the roster as like more brand friendly pc kind of safe people in my opinion each other during a face-off 
God is not here. I want to make it very clear that I think Greater Clash is a net positive. As a lower profile event, there aren't many big names, but it still brings in a respectable amount of money, with the first one raising over $1 million split between three charities. One of the fighters on the undercard for the second Creator Clash was a musician named Tyler Cassidy, popularly known as Froggy Fresh, and before that, Krispy Kreme. Froggy belongs to an era in the early 20 teens where funny or odd people used to go extremely viral, being featured on sites like College Humor. In those days, the internet felt much smaller, so a video garnering even 10 million views was known to a large chunk of people in the online space. And indeed, some of Froggy's videos received over 10 million listens and views, including his hit comedy single, The Baddest, which he released all the way back in 2013. I am the, baddest the baddest of the mall. I never even knew who this guy was prior to Creator Clash, by the way. I don't know how I missed him. I was watching YouTube a lot during that time period when he was big. I had never seen any of his shit. I had never even heard of Froggy Fresh before. There they were. I, I kind of vaguely recognize this video and his appearance, I guess. It's just like a guy that existed. I was never watching this or listening to this. Me, I stood up, grabbed my Nerf pistol off the shelf, then headed out the front door to wreck somebody's health. I walked over to James, he was chilling with his dame. I roughed him up a little bit, injected for his chain. Pulled out my Nerf gun so he didn't do a thing. Then I winked at him and told him, you ain't never out of range. When the drama starts, Nerf gun goes bang, 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 bang. Like I, I never I never even heard this. It's funny to hear now, but I never even heard of this guy. He still uploads today under his real name, so he's by no metric a nobody. In Creator Clash 2, Froggy was going to fight a mid-sized YouTuber, Chris Raygun, who got his fame. Is he a nobody? Hold on. I don't even know like what he's up to now. Froggy Fresh videos. Uh so his last video got 460k views. I mean, for a channel that hasn't uploaded in eight years, that's quite a bit. Doesn't he, he has another channel though, right? Froggy Fresh new channel. Tyler Cassidy. This is him now. Um Oh, well, he does get some decent views on some of them. Well, so this is, let's see, pre-boxing stuff. I mean, is nobody, I don't want to insult him and call him a nobody, but he wasn't someone who was pulling major views, right? I think you can say that with confidence. He wasn't like a huge name to get. He was a name. People recognize the name a little bit from the olden days, but it wasn't like, you know, getting like Judeon or something like that, right? Chris Raygun, I used to watch Chris Raygun back in the day. He had some good videos. Came from the skeptic era. Although it was just an undercard match, it was shaping up to be an interesting fight. And both Froggy's and Chris's fans were waiting with bated breath for their boxing debuts. That was, of course, until just three weeks before the day of the fight, when Froggy was unceremoniously removed from the card. On March 25th, 2023, the official creator clad. Like ideally, I think if you're doing a YouTube boxing event, the people you should be picking are gonna be people who are like currently relevant and that everyone knows, right? Easily recognizable big names. I know it's hard to get everyone for that. That, but picking like Chris Raygun, someone who was really relevant like seven years ago and hasn't really made a lot of videos since then, not to shit on him too much, but he's not a super relevant dude. And then also picking Froggy Fresh, who like once again was really relevant like seven to ten years ago, but is not really relevant now. They weren't the biggest names, certainly not even the biggest names they could get. So I'm curious why those are the people they chose. Um, yeah posted this terse statement to their official Twitter. There's been a change in the lineup and Froggy Fresh will no longer be fighting against Chris Raygun. We will announce his replacement in the coming days. With just three weeks left, the countdown to Creator Clash- Dude, when this, when this fucking tweet came out, this was like an event horizon for items. This is crazy. This is when like, I feel like the Creator Clash controversy is when things got really bad for him, in my opinion. Two has begun. The decision was met with because people already didn't like him from the OnlyFans thing and the Sam thing, but this is like the drama just got more and more insane. And this is when it got picked up more by like Kiwi Farms type people, Lolcow Farms type people who were just like dunking on items relentlessly. You had a new drama every single fucking day, I felt like, about iDubs. It was like a content farm era of iDubs. Complete bewilderment. If Creator Clash felt comfortable enough to kick Froggy from the- They did it because Chris and Anissa are friends and Froggy at a similar height. Yeah, I mean, I get that, but I feel like for an event like this, getting just your friends involved is probably not good if your friends aren't famous. The match so close to the event, as they readily acknowledged in the two-sentence statement, he must have done something seriously wrong. For about two hours, rumors began to swirl, until the Creator Clash account followed up with the additional message, Creator Clash's goal is to make an inclusive and fun environment for our creators and fans while giving back to charity. This has always been our mission, and Froggy's recent behavior does not align with that mission. We look forward to sharing this positive experience on April 15th. As the amount of quote tweets might indicate, including the fact that they locked replies, 
And once again, I feel like part of the bigger problem with this kind of stuff is they just weren't honest about why he was kicked. Like it, for Idubs, the guy who was like the epic commentary YouTuber and destroyed people epically on the internet, for him to be like making this weird kind of PR statement where he doesn't even really say what happened, it's a really weird position for someone like him to be in. You know, it's a really weird position for someone like him to be in. So you just wouldn't you wouldn't expect that. You know, it, it was a big departure from the brand for him to not even explain it or be honest about why Froggy was kicked. Like it was just it was really it was really odd. It was really odd. It wasn't what you would expect. As on the statement, it did nothing. Were they right to kick him? Probably not. ...thing to quell the drama, and the decision began to be publicly lambasted all over Twitter. Even Moist Critical, a massive YouTuber and one of the boxing commentators, publicly questioned the decision, saying, I'm really disappointed by this. Kicking him for Twitter controversy after months of training is brutal. Hopefully they reconsider this decision. Like, you, you don't want this guy, who's like the arbiter of good takes... The arbiter of good takes, you know. He's the guy who's level-headed in base. You don't want this guy to be, like, questioning your decision, especially if you're Idubs. Evidently, the sentiment was echoed as his tweet ratioed the Creator Clash response by a factor of over 10. Three days later, Ouch. Creator Clash followed up with a third, lengthier response that somehow said even less than the previous two. It referenced violations made to a legally binding contract, but just like the previous two statements, it failed to make mention of what those specific violations were. The whole thing read like the same non-answering stonewall of text you'd get from an out-of-touch corporate entity apologizing for making True. a racist pair of socks or something. Not an explanation that actually showed respect to the fans. It was the exact kind of behavior Ian might have once criticized. And once again, many fans found this unsatisfactory. Very big uh, vibe check, tonal change from Idubs, you know? Because it feels like he's, a, he's like pulling, pulling the ladder up. He's a part of the YouTube establishment now rather than being like a based fighter for the little guy. By this point, there were three main theories for why Froggy was removed from the fight. First, it could have been a joke he had made where he said if he lost the fight, he would force himself to subscribe to Anissa's content. Funny. I think that's probably the reason. I think that's probably the real reason, to be honest. 215, if I don't hurt you beyond what anybody could have imagined, I will be so disappointed in myself that I will subscribe to Anissa's OnlyFans. A lot of people seem to run with this theory at first, although I always found it to be tenuous. Despite this, Ian had already earned himself a reputation as being... If that wasn't the actual reason, that was definitely part of the dominoes that, like, made them upset about it, right? Because he's, like, fueling the kind of, cr what in, you know, in, 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 in Ian's view, cringe narrative um, about his girl, you know, about his girl. The shit he had pushed back so hard against in his items response video to the OnlyFans shit. Emasculated and thin-skinned by some, so those individuals ran with the idea that he had interpreted it as a malicious dig and thus gave Froggy the axe. The second theory had to do with a Twitter tussle Froggy had with Anissa's mother. And no, I'm not making that up. An account that has all but been confirmed to be hers started referring to him as the a- The Pied Piper. Your 50-year-old mom is calling herself the Pied Piper on Twitter, bro. I'm so thankful my parents have so little knowledge of what the fuck is going on online. I would never want my fucking mom to be on, like, Reddit or in Twitch chat or on Twitter, like, defending me from anything. Just stay out of it. Quickly calling for his removal. Froggy then retaliated in a couple of quote tweets. Given that her wish for him to be nixed was eventually granted, it wasn't hard to see why she could have been the reason for his removal. The third and most popular theory was that it was a direct response to Froggy training with none other than Sam Hyde. After all, if there's anybody who can piss off Idubs, the Candyman can. For context, Sam had been offering to train just about anybody for the last two years. With the release of Getting Away With It, Idubs and his boxing event were now directly in the Ghost of Key crosshairs. In preparation for the first creator clash, Sam successfully trained Harley of Epic Mealtime fame. Harley Morenstein is here! In his bout with Aaron Hansen from Game Grumps. He offered to train Idubs in his fight against Dr. Mike, but obviously this was ignored since the static between Sam and Ian had been growing ever since 2020. In fact, despite being Harley's trainer at the first creator clash, Sam and his representatives were not allowed to attend the event at all because Ian thought there was a good chance he would do something to make a scene, which... In fairness, I think that's a relatively fine assumption. I think there probably was some likelihood that Sam was going to try to do something. Is he a terrorist? Is he going to do something dangerous? No, obviously not. But was he going to try to, you know, punk Ian a little better, promote his own personal brand? Yeah, I think that probably will be true. Did he deserve to be banned from the event? Probably not, though. Let's be honest, is not that unreasonable of an expectation. We have a sad Sam Hyde at home watching this. Do you want to say shout out Sam Hyde? Uh, yeah, uh, sorry Sam Hyde that that happened to you. <laughs> That's crazy. The fact Brandon even got him to say that is nuts. A <laughs> 
Dr. Mike definitely had no idea what the hell was going on. A couple of weeks after the event, Idubs did go on to address the controversy for a fourth time and finally provided some answers. But before we get to that, remember- Bro, the way that that video is edited makes it look like his hair is sticking straight up in some kind of like vaginal pubic hair type haircut. This is a crazy edit. The controversy for <laughs> This is crazy. Because he, he just mirrored it on the top of the image, but it looks crazy. Finally provided some answers. But before we get to that, remember that with Froggy being pulled from the event, this means Chris Raygun was without an opponent. But Ian and Anissa were here to save the day. And to fight the 5'4", 130 pound Chris, they quickly subbed in William Haynes, a 5'10", 145 pound menace. Now, obviously a new fighter who hadn't been training for this event until being brought in at the last minute is going to be at an inherent disadvantage, but Haynes stood a staggering six inches taller than Froggy Fresh. This switcheroo was borderline evil. And this is, yeah, I mean, this is like having an infant fight a fucking high schooler. Like, well, they're both, you know, they're both minors. They can fight. It's like, okay, we need to have a baby fighting league and a, and a high schooler fighting league, okay? There, there's differences, okay? Of course, the fight went about as well as you'd expect, ending in the second round on a Dude. TKO. Although to Chris's credit, he took this injustice in stride. Other than that and a few other day of incidents. Yeah, there's Brandon. <laughs> Free Froggy Fresh. That got brief attention. The overall event was a relative success, and most of the attendees had a positive experience. And a few days after the event, YouTube Drama did what YouTube Drama does best and died. I was there at this event. Watching this shit go down in real time was crazy. It was crazy. You know, the, the thing I will give Ian credit for is it was still a fun event, you know? I don't know if it was mostly because my friends were there, um, but it wasn't that bad of an event in person. Um, I see why I didn't sell very many tickets or, you know, sell out online in terms of pay-per-view, but I was there. It was entertaining enough for me. Died out, but this wasn't I don't regret spending money on he it. He was unsatisfied with how the narrative had ended, and he would have the final say, even if it would damage his reputation beyond repair. Police brutality. About four days after Creator Clash 2, Ian and Anissa joined Ethan Klein on the H3 podcast for a post-event interview. They discussed the fight and made some... Would you go to Creator Clash 3? Um, I don't think it's going to happen, but maybe. I, I would imagine after the whole charity loss, I don't think whatever charity work with them is going to want to work with them again. And on top of that, like the risk of them fucking it up again, I, I assume is going to make them not want to do it. But I mean, I would go. Why not? Vague comments about negativity online. You know, stress from the... Wait. Hold on. Just the fight and made some vague comments about negativity online. Just me? Okay. You know, stress from the event accumulating because we had just know, me. plenty of drama and, uh, you know, just criticism and everything online. It's just like, it all kind of builds up. Although they were clear that it didn't carry over to the event itself. At the very end of the 45 minute interview, Ian announced that he would be addressing controversies on his main channel. Then about two weeks later, the video Thanks, was Josh, realized, titled Addressing the Froggy Fresh Drama. It's hard to describe describe just how redundant this video is. But even the substantive points he tries to make fall painfully flat. He starts the video by explaining he didn't want to address the controversy earlier because he was worried it would jeopardize the success of the event. The reason I didn't address any of this sooner is because I... I'd say the event's success was already jeopardized by the way the controversy was handled outside of the lack of statements. I'd say the lack of statements probably made it worse, if I had to guess. I was terrified of jeopardizing the success of the event because there are a lot more people involved in this than just Anissa and I, uh, and I didn't want to f it up for them. These are people that I really care about, and I felt like it would be very selfish if I was like, I understand public perception right now, guys. I'm just gonna make a quick 10 minute video and I'll squash all the rumors, I'll squash all the beef. Which doesn't make sense given that he did address the controversy already in a statement twice. Just because the statements were shitty doesn't mean that they didn't happen. For some reason, Ian thought that confusing everyone to the point that his own event commentator came out publicly against the decision was some act of sanctity. And I'm not sure how forcing your undercard fighters to come to your aid in Twitter spaces is shielding everyone from the drama. But hey, who am I to question the content cop? Ian goes on to explain that the main reason why Froggy was kicked from the event was for his association with Sam Hyde. Now, as I've shown before, things have changed with Sam and Ian's relationship since the getting away with the documentaries. I'm sure some of you are expecting me to leap to Sam. Yeah, I mean, it seems like Sam definitely became hell-bent on fucking with Ian as much as possible at this point. To, to own him back, you know? Sam's defense and portray him as Ian's only hope to restore his masculinity or something. But Sam has since made comments about Ian and more so Anissa that give the couple more than enough reasons to not want to associate with him, much less have him come to their event. Also, in Anissa's own words, Sam, you are a scorpion and Ian is a frog. Yes, yeah, scorpion because I flipped it on him when he came out here to make me look like an ass? I don't think so, Anissa. Oh. This much is totally fair, but 
Lol. Say now that anyone who yes. associates with Sam shouldn't be allowed to participate in the boxing event is as sophomoric as it is cowardly, especially when this person has been training for several months to participate in the fight. Ian yeah, I think kicking him at the last moment was pretty dumb. Um, especially when, like, what did he really do with Sam that was that bad? They filmed, like, a training video. Is it that big of a deal? You know, I, I understand the, like, emotional reaction to, like, having somebody who says something about that, something like that about your wife, like, and then, like, he's worming his way into your shit, and one of your fighters is, like, associating with him. I understand the emotional reaction, but logistically speaking, like, kicking that guy right before, and, like, the way it was handled with getting that, you know, the, the William dude who was, like, six inches taller than Chris Reagan to fight, it just didn't make sense. Also attempted to show that Froggy never cared about the event. I don't think the Creator Clash statements were from him. I assume they had a boom PR team on payroll maybe but even at that like it's on his payroll right it's it's his decision how the statements are made he can still choose how it's said or what is said at the very least the content of it by playing clips of comments he had made about e-girls and sex work uh, yeah I sure hope it does the point he's making is that if Froggy was truly passionate about the event he wouldn't have made the statements that he did for anyone who's under the impression that Froggy has been like reasonable and chill and respectful uh, through this whole process he hasn't been he's talked mad shit about me Ian doesn't want people who are bigger that's definitely true. He definitely wasn't reasonable. He definitely talked mad shit. But at the same time, uh, it's just like, take it on the chin. Is that big of a deal? You need to have like zero drama. Like you started the whole Sam Hyde thing. You're kind of reaping the consequences of it now, right? It's expected that you're going to get shit on for this. You're going to get beta male a little bit, you know? I'm obviously joking with that term, but yeah. Like the, the whole reason this Ian was in this position is because of his own actions and more talented than him, upstaging him. That's what it is. Anissa. Ian's masculinity has been completely removed via Anissa. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, participants of the event. Uh, he doesn't like... I mean, Froggy's just repeating what stuff that Sam said there, right? Like basically. the culture of Creator Clash, and he mentioned that. And Chris Raygun and all these people, it's like some big Ethot worship and... Um... Ethot worship? Well, why do you want to be there, I guess? <laughs> I, I, I feel like defending Froggy here. Should he have been kicked? Probably not, but defending him. And what he's saying is funny and, like, you know, kind of base, but it's not surprising he was pissing off Ian with this kind of stuff, you know? Party at these things. To be honest, I thought it was quite the... I feel like the whole thing would have been wouldn't have been nearly as bad if Harley and Keem mostly Harley would have kept his mouth shut. I feel like Harley was not that big of a deal. I feel like Harley defending Ian was not a huge concern. I like Harley. I think Harley was somewhat based even with his takes on this. Um I like Harley. Gift to you that we'd kick you off the card. You have no more obligations. The problem is that most, if not all, of the comments disparaging the event were made after he was removed from the card. In context, they sound like Froggy lashing out because he was upset by the whole situation. So unless Ian has a time machine, this was just a disingenuous attempt to retroactively justify his actions. While much of the video was deceptive and misleading, probably the most egregious error was a lie by omission at the end of the video. You see, Froggy had publicly claimed that Creator Clash had contacted him with a legal request to forfeit the $15,000 he had been given for training. Ian addressed this by saying that Creator Clash is not suing Froggy for the $15,000 and they would be leaving it at that. By the way, we weren't suing Froggy. Uh, we have no interest in going to court over $15,000. We wanted that $15,000 back, but he wasn't giving it to us. So we, we have to leave it at that. You know, we're not suing him. But this downplays the actual content of the notice, which Froggy posted to his Twitter shortly after Ian's video went up. The letter, sent by the general counsel of Creator Clash, not only threatened legal action if he did not forfeit the cash, but also served as a cease and desist notice, stating that they would additionally pursue legal action if Froggy even discussed the event in the future. We have to yeah, the weird, the weird thing about this is like, is there any charitability you can give items? Did he just not see the letter somehow? But if you hadn't seen it, don't you think he would explain it? Like, maybe it was sent, but he's responsible for the whole event. No, I can't explain. He definitely was, I'd say, lying by omission here. I would say that's accurate, yeah. Like, clearly there was some, they were at the very least threatening him with legal action, even if they never planned to really go through with it, you know? leave it at that. Truth to be told, they never followed up on this request, probably because it would have destroyed Ian and Anissa financially and in Yeah, and I, the thing is I, they did send, send a cease and desist. I, if I had to guess, they were probably trying to scare Froggy. They probably never actually intended to take him to court over 15 grand, but even like doing that move and then publicly saying that <laughs> publicly saying that you weren't fucking doing this shit is like retarded items did not pioneer anything the genre of commentary is already going strong he jumped on the bandwagon if you go to if you go back to his content comps you can always see his virtue signaling and, okay this is retarded though he did pioneer shit he did change the landscape for sure people to this day look back on items 
He did. He didn't create the commentary genre. He did it better than anyone else was. This is just wrong. There's some historical revisionism going on here. Okay, Items did make fire content in the courts, if not civilly, then in the court of public opinion. But the fact is, they threatened Froggy for daring to be upset that he was kicked from the event, and furthermore, they considered filming a vlog with Sam Hyde to be a breach of contract and conduct <laughs> that has degraded and offended the event sponsor. Yeah, once again, like you can't be Items with this kind of shit going on in your in your in your in your repertoire, right? When you're like le based epic, I don't care troll guy, and then you're also like later on sending cease and desist, and then you know not really telling the truth about it. Give us a commentary channel history lesson. Sure, I can do that after this. Sure. A claim that is shaky at best. The entire time while I was watching the video, I tried to understand what Ian was broadly attempting to accomplish with it, and this is where I go back to the previous two blunders in Idubs complains sex work and getting away with it. In all three videos, he tried to draw a contrast between himself and whomever the subject of the videos were. In the complaints video, it was about overly obsessed fans who blew a gasket over his girlfriend. Maybe not the best phrasing. In the documentary, it was about Sam Hyde and the consequences of never maturing. Both of those videos failed in their own ways, as we've seen, but with his froggy fresh response, it comes across as Ian putting himself on a pedestal as a reformed man who now champions sex work because he loves women more than froggy. One part of the video that stuck out to me was where he stated that he had spread a lot of negativity on the internet and wishes to turn a new- There it is again! I'm not going crazy, am I? I'm not going crazy. ...page in his book and make a for that i think a lot of the content i've made has been irresponsible and i'm not misguided. losing my mind and i think i've hurt a lot of people negativity n-e-g okay wooly open a dictionary bro that's just not cool with the content i've made uh you know despite many people being entertained by it you know i'm not trying to take that away from you and i think i've done a lot of bad and uh you know at the bare minimum i've just put a lot of negativity out there in the world and i'm working on not doing that but it's hard to interpret this video where he edited clown emojis over his descenders faces and shot strays at other youtubers who had nothing to do with this drama as some heartwarming act of positivity and maturity. It was all the bite of Content Cop without the substance. Truth to be told, those who were on Froggy's and Sam's side were never going to find this defense satisfying, regardless of what Ian said. Although Ian certainly didn't do himself any favors along those lines anyway. And even if Ian were right, it was hard to overlook how bitter and desperate he came across, just like the sex work video. The good fans in his community were so s Yeah, like the problem is like his actions themselves and the OnlyFans thing, his actions weren't really bad. They were just, like, kind of cringe from a lot of people's perspectives, but his response was bad. In this situation, the actions he took were, like, really dumb, and then his response was also really dumb and unsatisfactory for everyone who watched it. Like, I don't remember anybody coming away from um, any of IW's responses being like, that was a good response, you know? The OnlyFans thing, there were some people with this, with this shit, like, and anybody who had any plausible deniability or, like, charitability for him was gone. Like, if those people did have that opinion, they didn't say it sick of the drama apart from like people who knew him like harley at this know? point that there were few who really wanted this video to exist at all Alienation. A couple of weeks later, Idubs finally delivered on his promised content cope, a video titled, I Miss the Old Idubs. I won't go into detail here because I would be belaboring the point. This video sucked. Indeed, in the video, he reiterated the same things he'd been saying about himself for the last two years. He's sorry about using racial slurs. He's sorry he cultivated an edgy audience from his edgy videos, the same audience that he now expects to stick by him, by the way, and so on and so forth. Many have been calling this video content cop Idubs. In fact, the top comment reads, I never would have guessed that his final content cop would be on himself. But in reality, this video is far from it. An intelligent, entertaining critique? It is not. It's more like a depressing look into the depths of Ian's insecurities where he unloads on his audience about how he discovered empathy for 17 minutes. This time though, he specifically made Saying that he developed empathy at like 35 years old is so, well, 31, 32, whatever it is, is like nuts too. Like it, it, the idea that like you can't, you, if you make sh co like commentary drama video shitting on someone, you can't have empathy is insane, right? It's completely insane. And I feel like it almost shows a lack of understanding of what made his videos good in the first place. Like he, he completely lost his way. He's like, uh, he's like Zuko. When Zuko lost, when Zuko completely lost his way, but he hasn't come out of the arc, okay? This is just like my, my favorite cartoon. Mention of the content cops. Why no keep gooning hat? Because I would never support that. Series as being harmful and cruel. He said it went beyond being edgy, and the Tana Mongeau installment where he walked up to her and said a slur was particularly regrettable. It is sad that... What's even funny about that is Tana herself, I don't know if he's going to mention it, Tana herself said that she felt like she deserved what happened, and she didn't even... 
she didn't even feel bad for herself. Ian now sees Content Cop as a net negative, but despite the fact that he feels shame for some of the tactics and points he put in those videos, putting all of them down as just cruel hit pieces that must be unlisted from his channel makes me wonder if he ever understood them as the hugely impactful cultural yeah. forces they often were. The Leafy Content Cop, for instance, wasn't- And most of the people who's making videos about like, like Leafy, Rice Gum, Keemstar, people like that, are these really people that you, like, you should feel bad for if you shit on them? Tana Mojo, like, I'm not saying they're like terrible, irredeemable people but they're not like people who are doing nothing wrong they were fucking up they were cringe they deserve to be called out it wasn't just great because he made fun of leafy for his appearance it was a direct attack against an entire brand of content that was frankly 10 times as vicious as anything ian ever produced people who are hugely popular today like pyrocynical shifted their entire career because of the seismic impact items had on the commentary community so if you don't see people bullying children and mentally disabled people on youtube anymore you partially have items to think in before people are like items had no real impact he was always shit which is not true he was good Bank for showing people that's historical cool. revisionism but putting that aside and putting aside the blatantly hypocritical statement that he no longer wants to be a negative person despite his virulent and negative call out of froggy fresh and others just two weeks prior ian has every right to feel bad about any cynicism he fostered in his audience but like i said before no content creator or artist who has been around as long as ian has is without sin imagine if filthy frank came back to apologize to all women ever for making fun of feminism in his content or if how to basic apologize to all chickens for murdering their children. As much as we might like to think that this video somehow restores balance in the universe and heals some deep cultural wounds, it's the same self serve It doesn't, because nobody was even complaining about that shit prior to his apology. All of a sudden, when his apology came out, people were like, oh, I experienced racism because of iDubs. These people had never said fucking anything. None of these criticisms even existed. Everybody loved his videos. They understood he was joking. They understood he wasn't actually racist. They understood he was making funny content, okay? They did. This is a... a commonly accepted thing and that's why critical's takes were so good and that's why people got so mad at it because they were like well items can apologize you can have an opinion on that it's like dude he didn't even do anything there's something to apologize for you can the point of youtube is having an opinion on things that's so stupid serving trauma dump as any other youtube apology video after all the worn out platitude goes actions speak louder than words could you imagine Uncle Iroh telling Zuko your girlfriend is a bitch ho who's ruining your career? Zuko, your girlfriend is Yoko Ono. She is a bitch ho who is ruining your career with the Fire Nation. There you go. Not the other way around. I can't but imagine Ian it. Has shown in his own act. Elvis Alien blamed Idos for his edgy humor, did he? Elvis Alien is, was like a 25 year old man watching Idos. What the fuck does that even mean? <laughs> no way he said that. ...that he has matured beyond the content he made before, making this video yet another pointless addition to his collection of penitential lamentations. Going back to Ian's froggy fresh response, he said that he had no idea. Did Elvis Alien actually say that? I want to see that. Elvis the Alien... I type that in. Elvis the Alien Idubs. Where did he say that? On Twitter? I've never seen that take. Uh, how the contents in a YouTube comment? What video? That the video would be received. I have no idea what public perception for this video. Saying his content was trash is wrong, but acting like his revolutionary who changed the whole game is just stupid. There were multiple YouTubers doing the same thing he was doing. That's just not true. There was nobody on YouTube who was doing commentary videos as funny as him, as, I, as high effort as him, as hard hitting as him, and nobody who did them nearly as impactful. There's nobody that was even comparable to Content Cop. Nobody was getting 30 million views in trauma videos back then. It was only him. The new time Dark Fit seemed higher quality. I like him. Thanks. Yeah, well, we got a new camera. We've been trying to improve writing and shit, make it a little bit better, do a little more in-depth stuff, so I appreciate that. He was going to be. And I think there is no statement that better sums up the sad lows he has crumbled to. It reminds me of another quote from his video on sex work. Do you think it was cool when I was running around in an oversized cop outfit? Yes. You see, if you asked Idub's friends why his fan base turned on him, they'd probably say the fans never- People who think it wasn't a pioneer just weren't around back then? Uh, yeah, absolutely outgrew their COD4 lobby, and they can't face the fact that Ian has matured beyond the unesthetic 20-something-year-old he used to be. So, good riddance. And while this may be true in part, it's not even close to the whole picture. There are plenty of us out there who would love to see Ian make content he is proud of without being subjected to this cringy apology tour where he spreads his positivity all over everyone. People like me are disappointed. Yeah, and the thing is, I would still criticize him for the cringy positivity tour, but I would also still watch his stuff if it was good. Like, I don't really give a fuck, right? If he if he made good content, I wouldn't care. I would keep watching him. It's just, he, he doesn't make good content anymore. It's not good. It's bad. If he made good content, I would still watch, like, the Airsoft Fatty video. I like that video. Disappointed. Not I would watch stuff like that all day. Edge, but because he lost his touch. The heart of Content Cop and Kickstarter crap were never that he was screaming racial slurs or being as... 
And I know from uh, talking to other YouTubers and stuff that there were other documentaries and stuff that he filmed that never made it out. Um, I don't exactly know why they didn't make it out, but there were other documentaries he filmed with like YouTubers that for whatever reason didn't come out. Um, maybe the way that the Sam stuff went changed his opinion on it. But years ago, I know he filmed at least one or two more that never came out. Um, I don't know why they didn't. As offensive as possible. It was that he was able to call out some of the most prominent figures on the internet on their hypocritical and poor behavior without making it all about himself. A common sentiment among disenfranchised Idub's fans is that they wish he would go back to the sewer and eat some more pickles. But after seeing Idub's final apology, I'm not sure that he even has that in him anymore. Idub's TV, more than any of his disillusioned fans, is stuck in the past. And unless something drastically changes, it's looking like he might stay there. Good video. Good video by Willy One. History lesson time for anybody saying that iDubs did not pioneer the commentary community. If you trust my opinion at all, when you trust what I'm going to show you, um, you'll be able to see how wrong you are, okay? The commentary community in YouTube history has been my autistic special interest since I was like 14 years old, okay? Commentary community, not so much. Um, in the past like three years or so, I've expanded my scope. But <sighs> this shit was like my autistic special interest for sure. And there were a few different waves of stuff that happened, okay? There were a few different waves of stuff that happened that are really important to look at if you want to understand what happened with the commentary community, okay? Commentary videos started, okay? Obviously, they've been around in, on YouTube in some form for a while. It's been a thing. But the, the way that it really went mainstream uh, was undoubtedly with Leafy is Here, okay? Leafy is Here originally was a Minecraft channel, okay? He ended up very sporadically uploading to YouTube for a while before he came back and he started uploading videos where he was doing uh, like basically rant videos, right? Commentary videos at the time, the only understanding people really had of them was like a gameplay commentary video in the wider community. It was, a, it was like a genre where you would just like put gameplay and you would commentate on something and you usually wouldn't be reacting to a video or shitting on someone or talking about a drama. Usually you'd just be talking about your life or something, right? Call of Duty commentary. This is what Sneeko started doing way back in the day, okay? This is what Sneeko started doing with all this shit way back in the day. This is what like Woody's Gamer Tag came up off of. This is what Wings of Redemption came up off of. This was like a co COD commentary. The uh, definition of commentary video shifted around the time that Leafy started noticing that if he talked about drama and shit on people, it really worked out. So he went from making, you know, just silly videos. Actually, I have archives of this. I can bring this up. He realized he can make videos shitting on general topics, right? General topics. So here's his channel when he had 23,000 subscribers. If this archive will fucking load, because web archive is like broken and retarded. Here's Leafy's channel. He had 23,000 subs, okay? Most of the videos you see are Minecraft videos, right? He was relatively inactive during this during this time. He wasn't posting a lot. He did make a few videos. He made a video called Money Whores. He had this video, the story of when I met a real life pedophile. These, this is like a story video, right? Commentary slash story time. But notice how these videos aren't like calling out one specific person, right? When it says commentary, it was just, it was just fucking gameplay talking about a subject, right? Eventually, he realized that his content could really be a lot more mainstream and a lot more popular, and he would get a lot more views if he called people out. So he began making videos that were talking about subjects, and they would have like a creator in the thumbnail, but typically he wouldn't be naming them and shaming them, right? Here's his channel at 213,000 subscribers. This is in September of 2015, okay? Kids that YouTube became big. These are videos where he would have gameplay, and he would just talk about stories from his time as like a gamer, okay? Kids at DDoS, kids that are toxic. These were big series. He would just bully children but not specific children right not specific children it was just a general topic he would put a picture of like a dumbass fucking kid or a dumbass woman in the thumbnail he would shit on them and that was it right but these videos wouldn't be usually picking a one specific person right it was just the idea of whoever this person is he would tell a story right well eventually he realized that if he actually shit on specific people he would get a lot more attention so he started making video response commentaries okay and these got way way more popular than any of the shit he was doing before and it made him way more popular on youtube okay here's his channel in this is february of 2016 and this one is September of 2015. He went from 200K subs to almost a million in just a few months. And how did he do that? Well, the worst music video ever on YouTube, the sexiest gamer girls on YouTube, the best rapper ever to live on planet Earth, the most mo motivational video on the internet. These are all ironic mocking titles where he's picking on various people and it got a lot of attention. So he was pioneering this kind of aspect of the community. He was content farming. And when he started doing this, everybody else followed. Everybody else followed in his footsteps, okay? Literally everybody, um, not every channel on YouTube, but everyone that wanted a way to the top saw that you could get 
popular off of drama stuff. And so you had people like Pyro Cynical, who previously was an MLG montage guy. He saw what Leafy was doing. He saw it could be popular and he started doing it. Okay. He started doing exactly what this guy was doing. And back in the day, you could probably accurately, for a time period anyway, call him a Leafy clone. Okay. At least for that time period. Um, you And then when, when people saw Pyro blow up off of doing it, everybody else started doing it too. Everybody else started bullying kids on YouTube and it was funny. It was whatever. It was cool. I don't have a problem with that. It was, you know, looking back, was it the best idea to pick on random children on YouTube? No, probably not. But people saw this as an opportunity and they started doing it. And as a result of that happening, a lot of other people followed in the footsteps uh, and they started doing gameplay commentary videos. Now, everybody blew up off of doing that, okay? This one format, all right? I'm trying to find this one image. There's this one picture I'm looking for, which is like this pyramid graphic with like Leafy at the top and all the other guys at the bottom. Um, let me see here. I can't even find this image anymore. I know it exists though. I used to see this image all around on YouTube, okay? Well, if you guys remember, you know what I'm talking about. But everybody started blowing up off of that, okay? But they weren't using face cam. Leafy would do face cam videos, but they weren't like, uh, they weren't like commentary videos, really. It was just like a bullshit video where he'd talk about his fans or something like that. It would be like this kind of thing. Whole retard that uses very respectable people on the YouTube community. You can see the kind of vibe that was going on at the time. We expose the man, the myth, the asshole. Leafy is here. See, many of you guys think you know Leafy is here, okay? But have you ever thought, what if I really don't? Hey, what the fucking shit is that? And this was not like regular content for him. He would just do this once in a while. He would do a video like this once in a while where he would just sit and talk to his fans about bullshit. He had this series called Leafy's Lovely Fan Base where he would like make fun of them, shit like that, right? Be like, oh my God, this is such a, guys, this is such a crazy YouTube comment. 35 year old fucking man, right? That was basically it. That was basically it. And then iDubs came on the scene. Now, I, I, I cannot reiterate this enough. If there were people doing face cam videos regularly before um idubs there weren't very many of them and after idubs started doing face cam videos and blowing up off of content cop everybody followed suit literally everybody fucking everyone okay idubs started posting videos like kickstarter crap that got attention you know people were watching them for sure uh but i think he only had about 100k subs by the time he got to the first content cop the first content cop came out and it was a game changer okay it was literally a game changer the content cop was on jinx a reaction channel at the time people would shit on a little bit but his video had skits it was it was really funny it had a face cam which this kind of video okay while this may seem crazy to you now this was a higher production, higher effort, higher quote unquote budget video than pretty much any other commentary channel was doing at the time. Okay. Like this, like this was like a very unique thing that was being done. Okay. And people saw this, they saw content got blowing up and they all followed suit. Wild Spartans at the time was doing gameplay videos. He switched over. Okay. To doing face game videos. I'm Alex. If he was doing face game videos before then he doubled the fuck down on it. Okay. Um, everybody saw this and they started following in his footsteps okay leafy started using face cam more pyrocynical started using face cam more everybody saw this as a change of the times and they started using their camera to show their face because you know it's obviously much more appealing and easy to connect with someone when they're using their face rather than when they're using gameplay right obviously we have nostalgia for it but there's a reason why people don't really do gameplay videos as much anymore and while they and when they do do it now they're not as uh in the forefront of YouTube, right? They're not. Who's the biggest gameplay commentary channel now? I don't even know who, I can't even name them. There's like 30 big face cam commentary channels now that are huge, okay? It it changed the game. Now, there were people after this that ended up doing uh, gameplay videos, but that was like a different wave. And those people are not that big. Sense of Society, yeah, those guys have some subscribers. They get like 100K average views. Who is the biggest person on YouTube who does face cam commentary videos? Critical? Do you know how big Critical is? Like 30 times as big as both of those guys combined. Drew Gooden, he did commentary videos for a while. He did face cam stuff. Now, H3H3 was also a part of this wave because he did face cam videos instead okay, of gameplay videos. He never did gameplay. But like, you look at Sensitive Society, how many views is he getting on average? You know, pretty decent. He's not doing bad. He's averaging like 100K views a video, 150K maybe, okay? You look at like Jarvis Johnson. Let's check out even his second channel. This guy is averaging 500,000 to a million and north of that views, right? He's doing way better. I think Jarvis Johnson's commentary, while I don't really agree with him uh, a lot of the time, it's probably more insightful than Sensitive Society. But I, I do think that the visuals of this shit does impact how people see it and gameplay videos became like passe at this point in time right idubs changed the whole game with that he he undoubtedly did there's no doubt about it you know it just it, it, that is the case i put jarvis drew curtis connor eddie in the same general bucket it's a different more mainstream genre i mean it definitely is a more mainstream genre but i think the point still stands right i think the point stands for sure presentation really matters it definitely matters um eventually the gameplay stuff would come back with a certain number of channels but 
and they did get views, but they didn't like, they weren't like culturally impactful, I would say. Like you had like Scrubby, like Scrubby did gameplay videos for a while and he, he blew up after Leafy left. He blew up in like 2018, right? After Leafy left YouTube for a while. And the same applies to like Cyrus and Benji, all those guys. Those guys got a lot of views, but they weren't like talked about in the YouTube culture. They just like saw what Leafy did and just farmed the same exact thing, basically, right? Like this, it changed the whole, it changed the game for sure. Um, and Idubs also like, if you just look at the views he got, right? Idubs on the content cop videos, I guess we can't even look at it now, but if you remember those videos, they all had like 5, 10, 15, 20 million views. The average face cam commentary video that was like relatively low effort was getting like 500 to a million on a really good day. How to give him PewDiePie his flowers? Well, PewDiePie, similarly, you know, I like PewDiePie, but he was, once again, he was like heavily inspired by like Idubs and Filthy Prank. Pe like PewDiePie didn't create the commentary genre. He just saw that it was working and kind of followed in the footsteps, you know? I, I don't think PewDiePie didn't everything, did anything revolutionary for commentary videos. He just saw what worked for other channels, like probably Pyrocynical, Idubs, stuff like that. And he just kind of became like an amalgamation. Are you saying Idubs invented sitting down and pointing a camera at you while doing commentary? <laughs> Obviously, he didn't invent it. He didn't invent turning on a camera, but he did change the game in that way. And now all those people do face cam. All the people who didn't do face cam do face cam. So yeah, little quick history lesson I think was important. Anyhow, good video by Willy One.